you haven't put the pieces together, we're going to talk about being an artist today. And I just kind of connected the dots myself. So we have a guy here who won a Grammy. But today you're going to hear from me. <laughs> I have not won Grammys at all. Um, but I, I want to ask you guys a quick question. How many of you guys wake up every day and you get to do what you love? Nice. Okay. More than, more than earlier. All right. <laughs> I think people are just sleeping. They're like, I ain't going to raise my hand. So I actually had the opportunity early on, sort of in my pursuit of working and, you know, finding the right job, to find something that I really loved. And I got to speak uh, as a senior in, in college in classrooms, and I found out, man, I really love this thing. I love public speaking. I love sharing my story. I love inspiring people. And actually, my first job, uh, which is a little bit interesting, is I got to speak on abstinence in high schools. <laughs> right? Right? Quite the adventure, right? So I'm in there, I'm talking to kids about, hey, it's probably a good idea to not have sex. And they're like, you got to be kidding me. You know, like, <laughs> we just had it in recess. It was just like the same, right? <laughs> they don't have recess in high school, though, so I don't know. But <laughs> they made recess happen. So I really found out, man, like, I love this doing this thing, and it's something that brings me to life and, um, you know, finding those little moments that really mattered. But I like messing with the kids from time to time. And uh, we, would, we, we had this day in specific where we talked about um, STDs. How many of you guys know what an STD is? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not because you were at the clinic finding out, you know. Uh, but there was a specific day we were talking about STDs. And uh, it was so interesting hearing some of the feedback from the kids, some of the questions. And so there was usually like a slide set up like this, and I'd be going through the slides, and every once in a while I like to, you know, throw out a question to see what they knew. Because a lot of times if you work with kids, you know, they always think they know more than they do, right? So I throw up one of the slides, and it says HPV. So I throw out the question, anybody, anybody know what HPV means? And one of the kids, man, so confident, sure of himself, he's like, yeah, suntan lotion. And I was like, my man, you're talking about SPF. Like, that's, that's a little bit different. Another classroom, I'm going through all the slides, and hepatitis C is on there, right? So I asked the same question. How many of you uh, guys know what hepatitis C is? And this one girl, out of nowhere, out of the blue, just so excited about it. Uh, yeah, that's like a vitamin. I was like, baby girl, vitamin C is different. You don't want hepatitis C in your orange juice. That's not. <laughs> One of my favorites, though, that really stumped me. This was in the eighth grade classroom. And I learned quickly. It's like you have to sometimes, like, you can't just assume that kids know stuff. And I, I used to assume that when I asked, okay, we're going to talk about the media, that kids knew what I was talking about until I found out that that wasn't the case. So I threw out the question, hey, how many of you guys know what the media is? And this one little girl, just she just like, that's like a big old ball of fire. <laughs> and I was like stumped. You know, I was like, what the, how in the world did she jump from the media to a big old ball of fire until one of her friends like clued me in? No, stupid, that's a meteor. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, wow. <laughs> wow, she really thought that, you know, in abstinence class, we're going to talk about meteors, you know? But it's so, it was so amazing because I would, I would like have these great moments in the class. And like I said, when you work with kids, you see these moments where like things start to shift and you can see them like sort of wrapping their mind around this idea and maybe believing it a little bit or like being inspired a little bit or being encouraged. And it's funny because I would leave the classroom and sometimes I would have lunch before my next couple classes and all the teachers would be there. And I'd have these conversations with the teachers, and inevitably some of them would say, you know what, you know that they're not listening to you, right? Like, you know you're not making a difference, right? You know what you do, it really doesn't matter. And I started to kind of connect the dots. I was like, man, what, what happened to them? 
Because I hope, I believe that, like, at one point, these people who dedicated their lives to education believe that when they step up in front of the kids that they actually believe and long for making a difference in their lives. But at some point, that shifted. At some point, it was no longer a calling. At some point, it became this job, this task, this thing you just check in for. Punch the clock, put in work, leave. And how many of us maybe find ourselves in that space where what we do every day is we just go to work. We don't live out a calling. We don't feel like we're we're full of this longing for doing something that's really meaningful. What we do every day, <sighs> got to go to work. Got to go make money. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't do good. And some of us, are, we're, fi- we're trying to find our life's work, you know? Some of us have lost sight of our life's work. Maybe we had it at one point and then it's just become drudgery. But some of us, we work and then we pursue dreams on the side, right? So how do we do this thing? That's part of what we're talking about in our series, Life's Work, where where we unlock our vocation. Joseph talked about being a producer the first week, right? Producing a life that matters. And last week, he talked about being a farmer and actually finding this place of rest, knowing that at the end of the day, God controls outcomes. So we have to learn how to rest and find that place. And today, we get to talk about being an artist. And this idea that we're all called to be artists. We're all called to be a source of beauty in the world. So how many of you guys in here consider yourself to be artists? Okay, so let me ask this question next. Why? Why, why do you think or consider yourself to be an artist? You can answer <laughs> in an artistic way. What's that? You like creating new work. It's in the job title. So you are the artist. Okay. Nice. I loved your movie. Your great movie. Why else? Talent. Okay. Creating for the sake of making things? Great. What's that? <laughs> having something to say. Yes. What'd you say? Instability, not having a nine to five. Instability. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Now, here's the thing. So as, as I even, like, talk about, hey, God wants you to be an artist, it sounds kind of like hippie, right? It's like, yo, we're all artists, man. <laughs> you know, like... But, how, but, but does it say that in the Bible, right? I mean, you know, when you step into the walls, like we're trying to figure out what God says about the life that we want to live. And fortunately for Joseph last week, he could open up the Bible and pinpoint a specific passage in the scriptures that says, hey, God said we need to rest. So how about we learn how to rest and understand that God's in control of the other stuff? But when, you know, God laid down the Ten Commandments, the 11th is not thou shalt be artists, Right? Like, number 12 is not like, you need to learn how to dance, (laughs) right? It should be for some of y'all, but I mean, (laughs) but that's not the commandment, right? It's not explicitly in the Bible where we can open up and pinpoint, okay, this is what the Bible says, so I need to learn how to be an artist. And sometimes when when we're trying to figure out what is God calling me to do, how is he calling me to behave or look or live out this specific life, what he's really saying is, hey, you know, I want you to look like me. What the Bible is specific and clear about, when we look at the scriptures, it says we are made in the image of God. And so we have to ask ourselves that question, well, what does he look like? So God has this amazing compassion. Maybe we need to be more compassionate. He has this unbelievable ability to forgive us no matter what. Maybe that's what we need to embody. And God created this vast universe full of so many stars and this amazing sun and the moon and all these planets. We look at oceans, we look at volcanoes, we look at the Grand Canyon, we look at each other, we look into each other's eyes, we feel each other's hair, and we can't help but notice that God is an artist. 
that there's something beautiful about the world that we live in, about the people that we get to come into contact with. And so what do we do with that? What do we do with this information that we are artists? Whether we want to believe it or not, I have to tell everybody in this room that you are an artist. And are you okay with that? Just because you don't do it for money doesn't make you exempt. You're an artist. I'm an artist. Now, here's the thing. It's a pretty big idea. There's so many ways that we can apply it. And so I want to talk specifically about, okay, how can we be sources of beauty in this world that is so boring and also so broken? And I think specifically, we can be people who create beauty in the midst of the boring and in the midst of the broken. So I want to use a, a passage of scripture that really stuck out to me as I started to unpack this uh, idea. It's in John chapter 2. So some of us are familiar with this story. It's basically when Jesus turns water into wine, and this is how it goes. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, <clears throat> and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cain of Galilee manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So here's part of what I think is pretty cool about this passage. Obviously, there's, there's a need in this moment, right? And it's a miraculous event. People are having a wedding. There's a little bit of a situation. Jesus' mother notices it, so she calls on Jesus to say, hey, can you, can you do something about this moment? And to me, what's artistic and beautiful about this specific occasion in Jesus' ministry is he gets creative. He, he shows us his artistry. And what he does is he takes this everyday element of water and he turns it into something that people love. Wine. He turns it into something that, that can actually make this event that much more compelling. He takes that thing, right, that is everyday and ordinary, and he turns it into something that is actually extraordinary. He takes the mundane, and he turns it into something that's meaningful. He takes the boring, and he turns it into something that's beautiful. I mean, there's a part of it, though, when I look at this, it's like, well, that's cool and all, but is this the type of stuff that God is really concerned with? Like, doesn't God only want to perform miracles that are on, like, this grand scale? Like, I made a dude walk. That's going to change the rest of his life. I raised somebody who was dead back to life. That's, a, that's amazing. Like, isn't that what God is concerned with, doing these, like, grand-scaled miracles? But then there's, like, that side of, like, okay, he turned water and made it into wine. Like, what good is that going to do for the wedding? Are they going to be more in love with each other because of it? Right? Like, maybe it lowered the cost of the wedding. Because liquor costs a lot of money, right, even back in the day. So you want to have a wedding, you want to get turned up. Like, that's what, you know, you got to turn, the, cut down the cost. Maybe he had a spiritual element to it, right? 
Because maybe he was like, no, 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 we're going to do communion after this. You guys want me to perform miracles? No, I got enough wine for communion after this. This is what we're going to do. Like, his, was, was that his agenda? Or maybe there's this notion, and the only thing that Jesus cared about in that moment, the only thing that God cared about in that moment is what I get to do is I get to add a touch of beauty to their day. I get to create a flare of excitement. I get to sprinkle this day with just a little moment of something that is enjoyable. And what if that's a part of what God cares about? Like, more than anything, what if God cares about poetry over piety? And we've made it about all the religious and the, and, and the things that kind of like bog us down instead of saying, no, like, God is in love with the poetic. He's in love with the song of our life. He's in love with the scenes that we get to create. And that happens sometimes in the things that are boring. There's, there's a, actually a, a quote from Kurt Vonnegut that I want to share. It's in my phone. And I think he, he, he kind of like touches on this. Where he says, the arts are not a way to make a living. They are a very human way of making life more bearable. Practicing an art, no matter how well or badly, is a way to make your soul grow for heaven's sake. Sing in the shower, dance to the radio, tell stories, write a poem to a friend, even a lousy one. Do it as well as you possibly can. You will get an enormous reward. You will have created something. How many of you guys like Instagram? <laughs> so I'm kind of in love with it. Now, here's the thing. I want to share a little bit of my Instagram journey with you guys, because I do have a journey uh, on Instagram. <laughs> and here's the thing. Like, my first, my first couple photos, um, they're, they're really bad. You know, like, I, it's just, like, so bad. It's like when you, you know, hear Kanye doing an interview, like, man, that's bad. It's like, why is he doing this? Like, these are my pictures. So this is the first one where... I didn't even know how to crop it right. Like, it was just, this is literally still in my feed if you don't believe me. You can, you can follow me. Um, that's my name right up there. You can follow me. I need more followers. So here's another one where, actually, my friend's here. So, yeah, and my friend Jeremy, he let me know, you need an iPhone 4. Like, something, something is really wrong with this picture. Uh, and this one, this is, you know those photo challenges that they do? <laughs> this one is, it was like the, ch the challenge was front door. So I got, I got super creative with it. And I was like, I'm going to show you the handle of my door. And then, you know, something happened. Like, I, part of it is like, I, I started to feel like, man, I really am bad. <laughs> like, I'm horrible at taking pictures and posting. And so what I did was I started to open myself up. And I have a lot of photographer friends. I started asking questions about what makes a good picture, you know, composition and lighting and, and all these things. And then I started to, to approach Instagram a little bit differently, saying, OK, this is maybe an opportunity for me to get better at this thing. And um, I started to grow a little bit. This is uh, me in my, my city, Chicago. And this is when I went to Spain with one of my friends who's also a photographer. Uh, and I just started to just like build this love for this art form. Here's a, um, a picture of my friend's daughter. And she, she has a hashtag, actually. She's, so she's kind of famous. Planet Olive, and she has this, you know, I taught her my go-to pose. That's what it was right there, my little modeling pose. Um, this is a picture from when I went to Germany and went to the concentration camp, and I just wanted to share this moment and kind of like the potency of the words that were on the wall, which has made the example of those who were exterminated here between 1933 and 1945 because they resisted Nazism, helped to reunite the living for defense of peace and freedom and in respect for their fellow man. Uh, here's a picture of my little brother. And those of you guys that know me know that I love the heck out of this guy. And so I was just hanging out with him in the WB lot, actually, and I snapped this picture. I kind of directed a little bit of it. <laughs> These are a couple of my camp kids. And, you know, one of my friends, I was, I was at camp, and I was sending her some pictures because sometimes I get... I do that with friends. I'm a big-time extrovert. 
So I need like, what do you think about this? And I get feedback and then that helps me kind of create. And she was like, you're being a little bit lazy, like work a little bit harder. And so I created uh, this picture that I'm super proud of. This is another one, which to me is like, what I love about this is the quote. My boy Ricardo said, God made us for a reason and that reason is having fun. <laughs> And part of what I think happened to me as I took on the everyday, ordinary, boring stuff of Instagram was I started to look at the world a little bit differently. Like my soul started to grow because I would pause and it wasn't just a moment that I would normally walk by. It was now a moment where I could see God doing something beautiful, where I could see people connecting a little bit differently, where the light was on someone's face and I was like, oh man, that, like, that just shows me how much majesty is in this moment. And that boring stuff that happens every day started to become more and more beautiful. And I could see more and more of God and my soul would grow in something as mundane, as boring as Instagram. And how many of us, we make this excuse as to why we don't want to be artists or why we can't create anything artistic because our life is just so blah. And nothing exciting happens. Because that's the only way we can create, right? There's only one ex exciting stuff is happening in front of us instead of understanding that we can take water, everyday water, and we can turn it into wine. Because our life is saturated with water. It's full of the boring. But let's make it beautiful. I mean, even when we come here, how many of you guys talk about church and this thing that we get to do together as if it was this super exciting, you know, group of people <laughs> or event? Church. <laughs> so cool. Sometimes when I hear people say that, I'm like, you're lying to yourself. You know that, right? Like, <laughs> but how can we make this beautiful? So many people say this is a boring thing. But if we say God is here, God is with us, there's, there's something beautiful and potent about that. And when we invite you in, we invite you into what God is doing in our lives not just to a place and to an event, but to something that is much more artistic and creative and beautiful. There's another part of this story that I really love. <laughs> and it's the point where, where Mary realizes something is, something's up, right? So they're at the wedding. Mary says, oh, no. They're, they have no wine. There's no more wine. You know, she says there's something missing here. Something's off. Something's broken about this moment. And she pinpoints it. She tells Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Which to me is like, I'm like, I don't know about Jesus right now in this moment. Because he says, well, woman, what does it have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And I'm thinking, I'm like, Jesus, must, he must be, you know. <laughs> He doesn't know what it is to have a Puerto Rican mom. Like, it's just, <laughs> right? My mom's here. <laughs> my mom's actually here today. And, you know, she's never hit me. My mom never hit me. I just, right, mom? You're like, never, you never laid it. <laughs> never touched me. Uh. <laughs> but there's, what I love about this moment is, like, so Jesus kind of like, yeah, what does that have to do with us? And what she says is, she's like, she tells them, do whatever he says. Right? Which communicates to me is there was a look that she gave him in that moment. <laughs> That's not in this, right? She was like, I will bust you upside your head. You know, like, she's like, you may be <laughs> the son of God and all that, but don't think you're above a beating, you know? <laughs> to me, this is a very human moment. We talk about Jesus being human and God, and to me, there's just so much humanity in this moment where you see sort of like the tension between mother and son, and she, she has a beautiful mom who knows what's best in that moment, says, you need to rise to this occasion. Something is missing. Something is broken. And it can be made better by who you are and what you can provide. How many of you guys love uh, Humans of New York or ever heard of 
Humans of New York. So what Humans of New York is, is uh, basically a photo blog that captures portraits of people, and then it'll have little parts of their story. And I fell in love with this about a year ago, really just pulled in by the stories and the pictures. And a couple weeks ago, I learned of a story that one of my friends tagged me on, actually. And there was a reason why they tagged me specifically, but it was a story of uh, a little boy named Vidal and his principal. And basically what the story said is that uh, Brandon, who um, runs the blog, approached Vidal, saw him on the street, and started asking questions. And Vidal started to talk about his principal. And he started to say that when we get in trouble at school, our principal actually, what she does is she'll like sit us down and she'll look into our eyes and she'll say, you're getting in trouble right now, I understand that, but guess what, you matter. Your life, it matters. You're gonna make a difference. There's something great in you. There's something beautiful in you. Which was different than what I experienced as a kid. When I was in eighth grade, and we were about to go on into high school, my principal sat us down and she said, you guys are gonna be in jail. <laughs> the young ladies in here, y'all gonna get pregnant. You guys are gonna drop out of high school. And there wasn't a, but you matter. <laughs> However, here's the, the better picture. And I realized something about being an artist. See, when an artist sits down and there's a blank canvas, they don't just sit down in front of that canvas and point out the reality of what's in front of them. They don't just say, here's what I see. I see, you know, what are you made of hemp? What is this cotton linen fabric here going on? And oh yeah, I see that they stretched you across some wooden boards and they nailed you to this thing. And you know what, you're kind of plain right now. There's not much to you. I mean, there's millions of you in the world. There's nothing special about you. And here you are. What am I going to do with you? You're just a blank canvas. That's not what artists do. Artists pick up that paintbrush, and they start to see the possibilities of this very simple thing that has a lot missing in the moment, but they can now dream up a masterpiece. See, the guy who created Humans of New York, he was unemployed when he started this thing up. He didn't have a job. Not only that, he wasn't a good photographer. He only had two weeks of experience in taking pictures. And so what he set out to do is that I'm going to take 10,000 portraits. I'm going to walk onto the streets of New York where people are notorious of not being nice, right? Like, people aren't nice in New York. He said, I'm gonna venture out into this broken world in my broken situation. I don't have a job. I can't even do this thing. But in my brokenness and, and the things that are missing, I'm gonna step out and I'm gonna try to create something beautiful. And what's amazing is, because of what he set out to do, this school, that Vidal is a part of, has raised over a million dollars because of his blog. I mean, he was on Ellen, he met with the president. His book, Humans of New York, is a bestseller. Time Magazine defined him as 30, one of the 30 under 30 that is changing the world. Yeah, but could it be that from this broken state, God wants to create beauty. And what's amazing is what the artist does, right, is they look at the blank canvas and they see the Mona Lisa. They look at unemployment and they see humans of New York. They look at Vidal and they see a Nobel Peace Prize winner. That's the mind of an artist. And when God looks at us, when he looks at you, when he looks at me, what does he see? When we look at each other, do we look through his lens? What do we see when we look at the everyday, when we look at the broken, when we look at the stuff that's tattered? What do we see? I gotta be honest with you guys. This week, uh, I, I rarely have 
rough spots. And I know last time I shared, I talked about hope, and so I kind of like unloaded a lot of stuff that's been like hurting me. But on Tuesday, I really had a day where I was just, uh, I just felt overwhelmed with like this, this anger that I didn't, I didn't have a reason for when I just, I just felt like I was, I was angry about stuff. I just felt like I was sad and I reached out to some people and I was like, man, just pray for me because I feel like I, I don't know what's wrong with me right now. And I was preparing for this message and I'm like, man, I want to create something beautiful that you guys can experience and that we can move away from and know that God is doing something in our life. And I felt that pressure. And then my mom flew in and I was looking forward to showing her LA and making sure that she had a good time and taking care of her. And, and, and then I was like, man, like I feel this, this pressure of like preparing and then like I want to make sure my mom is taken care of. And then as I dug deeper, there's this thing that I've been wrestling with I've been having these conversations with my brother because a couple of weeks ago, my brother was arrested, the brother that I showed you. And for those of you that know me, my brother means so much to me. And I've done all that I, you know, can as a big brother to make sure that I'm living in front of him this life that is compelling and beautiful. And then when I got this news, I was like, man, what do I do now? then I was reminded as I was creating and crafting this talk, it's like, see what God does as he looks at the blank canvas. See, I look at my brother and I look at some of the decisions that he's making and I'm like, there's a masterpiece there. There's beautiful artwork waiting to happen. My brother's life, it will be so compelling and I'm going to make sure that as a big brother, I refuse to give up. I refuse to stop loving him. I refuse to stop painting. I refuse to stop looking into his eyes and telling him, you matter. You will make a difference. And maybe that's where we're at today. Where we feel so overwhelmed about the things around us, about the stuff that's going on in our everyday life, about the boring, about the mundane and there's family stuff, and there's job stuff, and it hurts. But what God wants to do is he wants to take that broken, tattered, messed up situation. He says, let's do work. Let's create a masterpiece. Whether that be what you can do in the lives of the people around you, or whether that be just in your soul right now, there's stuff that I'm trying to address. There's some stuff that's missing. Let's create art. I want you to be a source of beauty. The world needs who you are. And that is my prayer for us today, that each and every one of us would open ourselves up to this artistic endeavor, that we would truly be artists, that we would truly be sources of beauty in the world that we live in. Pray with me. made to create, we were made to, to push forth beauty in the world that we live in, and I pray that as relentlessly as possible, we would not stop until that's what we can pinpoint in our life, how you work and how you show up. I pray that you would take those boring everyday moments, Lord, and you would give us inspiration, that we would take the time out to see your hand in the mundane. I pray that those overwhelming, broken situations in our life would not hold us down, Lord God, but that we would pick up that paintbrush and we would start to paint with you. And even right now in this moment, I pray that if people in this room feel so held down by the things that are missing in our life, that they would feel you pick up their hand and begin to start to paint a new picture of what their life can look like with you. 
Father, this time is yours every day, is yours. Thank you for the new song you've placed in our heart. May we sing loudly. May we sing with joy and pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.